So for rest you did right. Yes. So what we are going to do today is like uh, now we know the bunch of uh, basic uh, formulas for the moment of inertia about a given axis. Now axis should be in your mind when you know the formula. You should also know that about which axis this formula is applicable. If the axis is not the same, then the formula will no longer be valid. So this is something which we need to keep in mind. So tell me what was the answer for the hollow cone? If someone remembers, sir, I'm asking. I'm asking, boy. Two. That's right. Correct. So the answer is M R square by two. Yeah, that's correct. So if it is a hollow cone, <clears throat> the answer was a much lower two, and that we can also do it, uh, you know, mentally. Why it is? So if the base radius is r, <coughs> then the i is. So now if I take a samurai, and if I cut it to small pieces like this, so you just cut parallel to the base. And if you hit from the top, let's say you make a you know you snap from the top, so all piece will get stacked together, right, like a disc. So hollow cone is like extension of a disc. You know, you just pull each part above, and then it takes a shape, and then they like this. So you must have seen some antennas in which you pull the antenna; it becomes thinner and thinner, and it gets stretched away. Something very similar is happening here also. If you cut the hollow cone into thin slices, and if you snap. The slice from the top to bottom, it will take a form of a disc. And because the disc answer, we know <coughs> the answer is same. So this is how you can remember this uh, answer. It's very pretty. But of course, you cannot do this the same for the solid cone. You cannot snap; it will puncture your hand if you do so. So anyway, in case of solid uh, cone, we need to take a disc, and we know the form of disc which we have to integrate. So now these are some basic formula. So uh, what we can do is we can summarize the formula at one place, and then we can do something more in the formula. Uh, let me remove this cell.
ओके सो दैट्स मेथड समरी ऑफ ऑल द फार्मूला द फार्मूला व्हिच वी हैव स्टडीड सो वी विल स्टार्ट विद द रिंग अबाउट इट्स एक्सिस व्हिच इज पासिंग थ्रू द सेंटर एंड नॉर्मल टू द प्लेन now for this axis itself the answer is m r then we have a disk and for disk About an axis passing through the center, and the radius is r, of course. So the answer is m r square by two. <coughs> and after the disc, what we have is uh, same is for cylinder. So I will I will not some take the cylinder. So the ring and hollow cylinder and disc will go with. solid cylinder they are same now we have a hollow sphere at see so if we have a so hollow sphere about any axis which passes through the center the answer is 2 by 3 mr square and if we have a solid sphere The answer is two by five mr square. <laughs> And then we had a cone. for solid sphere i uh, sir i i think for 2 by 5 mr square so solid sphere is 2 by 5 mr yeah correct 2 by 5 mr so for hollow cone it was how much so it was mr square by 2 Hmm. Just like a disc. Okay, so even this answer is <coughs> same as the disc. And the last we can keep is a solid cone. C M R square by two. No. Three M R square by ten. Yes. So. For solid cone, it is three by ten.
So now these are the values you need to remember. Now these are basic formulas and all other formula we can derive from these formulas. If you know this very well, then the rest will be easy. So the ring will also take care of the hollow center and the disc will take care of the solid center. And uh, primary we have six formula. Okay, and then from six, we can derive 6,000 formulas if you want. Okay, the rod formula. Okay, so one thing also I missed is the rod formula. Let me mention here only. So if you have a rod, in rod, so the width or diameter is taken negligible compared to the length. So if you have an axis which is passing through the center and normal to the length of the rod, <coughs> then the moment of inertia was how much? ML by by twelve. Ha, ML is twelve. And if I take from the end, let's say the axis is shifted to the end of the rod. Then the answer was how much? I equals to by three. M L square by three. So now just remember these formulas. In fact, you should know the derivation all the time. That's a better the best option. But in case if you don't remember, at least you should know the formula. You can just take a relook at the formula. We can begin with something more to this. So I hope this is done. So the next formula that we derived was if you have a rectangular sheet of length L and the width B, so we had drawn two lines, one bisecting width-wise or length-wise. So if I call this as I1, and if I call this as I2, I hope you remember the answer. MB square pi. So what is I1? I MB square pi. square by 3. 12. And ML square by 12. I2 is 12. ML square by 12. Oh. So this is also done. OK, now let's do something. A regular problems. So if I give you a rod which is not uh, and the axis which is not perpendicular, yes, this makes some angle theta. Now this is the axis of rotation. So I want a moment of inertia about this axis for this given rod, which makes an angle theta. So what will be the moment of inertia? ML by 2 sine theta square by 2. Pardon? ML square by 4 into sine square theta by 12. No. So you derive from basics. Just do it the derivation. I hope you all know how to do the derivation, right? Yes, yes sir. Yeah, take elementary, find the elementary moment of initial for elementary mass, and simply integrate this. So before you know any formula, you should know the basic. L by 2 is the distance on the both the side of the axis. Correct, correct. So L by 2 is the distance on both sides of the axis. So 
ml square by 12? No. So the modus operandi will be same, like the way to derive is same. So you go x and cut dx, you move x somewhere, you cut dx. But now what we look for is the perpendicular separation of the mass from the axis. Now this is the separation. So we always look for the per pinnacle separation. So that's the basic core idea. And this separation is not difficult to find because if this is x, if the swan is x, if theta is the angle, then r is <coughs> x sine theta. So what you can write is di equals to the elementary contribution that this will have, the resistance it will create is the mass of the element into distance square from the axis. So this is again mil. And uh, this is again uh, x sine theta. What is it? But theta is a constant one. Too. <clears throat> so rest will be the same thing. So now if you integrate, <clears throat> uh, this is dx. Sorry. From here. So m by l <coughs> sine square theta x dx. And now you can write from minus l by 2 to l. Which will give you the answer m n square by 12 but into sin square. Now, this you can rethink as like this is something which you can uh, imagine as m by 12 into l sin theta, which is a projection length of this rod per pentacle to the axis of rotation. This is like projection length. So, it is like we need to replace the rod by the its equivalent projection, and the projection will be. Per pentacle to the axis. That's it. <coughs> so this entire length will be L sin theta. If this is theta, so this entire projection will be L sin theta. Okay. So anyway, this is the way to think or re remember in case if you're in hurry in the examination, just do this quickly. So now, if I give you a problem like this, so we have a rod, and the axis is neither at the end nor at the center, it is somewhere here, A and B. So it divides the rod into two parts of length A and B, and the total mass is in. So now the question is, what is the moment of inertia about this axis. So of course you can do it by integration and putting the limit from minus a to b. But the question is can you do it without integration? Anyone?
Tell me. Sir, so like yes. this, uh, m by l a square plus <coughs> m by l b square. There is no l here. There is no l. Where do you see l? So then I replace l by a plus b. Yeah. So m by a plus b. Okay, fine. Then into a square. Hmm. Plus B square. Okay. So that's the answer. Hmm. Yeah, I got different answer. Yeah, tell me your answer. Uh, I I is equal to m into a square minus a b plus b square by three. Hmm, that's correct answer. <clears throat> So of course you can do the integration as I said and uh, integrate from minus a to plus b. <coughs> but let's say think this has a two mass of mass uh, m1 m2 and the axis will act as the end. So the moment of inertia you can also do it as m1 b square by three. The reason is obvious because that's the end of the rod. And again m2 a square by three. Now the mass ratio will be in the same as the length ratio. And therefore we can replace M1, M2 in terms of M. So we can write M1 as M upon the total length into its length, which is B, I think. Yeah. And M2 will be M upon total length into A. And once you substitute this value, we'll get the answer like this. So what we'll get exactly, I can tell you that what we'll get is I equals to M upon A plus B into three into A Q plus B. Now you can take a plus b, a q plus b q formula. So a q plus b q is a plus b into a square minus a b. Plus b. So once you substitute, you'll get the answer. Okay. <laughs> now, sometimes knowing such manipulation is also helpful. So these are different perspectives of thinking about a single process. So of course, you can do by integration, you can do by uh using the previous known formula and in physics it is always useful to you know use the some result which is a derivation of some question as a uh, the basic step to lead the other problem so those things are always in place and uh, we need to develop such perspective and solve the question faster So imagine now, let's do this question. Again, we'll do it by some uh, theorem later on. But as long as I'm not teaching you any theorem or any uh, trick, just stick to the basic. Now I'm giving you a semi-circular ring. <coughs> of radius r and now you're supposed to find the moment of inertia about this axis to solve from this
अक्षर है टू पाई थ्री एम आर स्क्वायर no of course not so what are you doing are you following the basic i have taken the elementary and if yes then how you have taken the elementary? so in case of ring what is the way of taking elementary i hope the elementary method you know how to take elementary for ring disk <coughs> rod sphere solid sphere elementary is a method i mean how to take is a very definite method whether it's a chapter of center mass or whether this chapter or any other chapter it remains the same <coughs> so not being able to derive means you not being able to understand how to take the element that's the only thing <coughs> so in case of circular object we take elementary as a arc right so we go theta and we move Did you take for this? And now this is the element. Now this is my element. And because this is the elementary, <coughs> this will be how much? This is the per perpendicular side. R side. Which is R side. So now you know how to write the answer. So D I, the elementary. Inertia will be dm into r square. Now you know how to substitute the values. So how to write dm and so dm we can write as a you can use the unitary method. You can write m by pi into d theta. I am taking the angle as a like comparison. So I know pi angle will have full mass m. So d theta will have mass m by pi d theta. That's very easy. <coughs> you can do also in terms of length, but uh, angle was the easier way. <coughs> And what we get is sine square theta d theta. Now this is d i. So i is definitely. So sine square we can write as pi by two. If integrate, we will get pi by two. Now that's your duty. So pi we cancel out, and what we get is so if I take a, a semi-circular ring and if I take the base as the axis of rotation. The answer turns out to be m i square by two. Similarly, can you do this question? <clears throat> so, if you have a ring, but then the axis is somewhere here. This is, this is the diameter. So, I want the answer about this axis. And this radius is R. So can you do it from basic? Basic means very basic. Anyone? So if you want to try, you can try. Then also we can do. Try this question. Again, it's not very easy. I know this is going to be difficult, but yeah, you can try.
and those who are not comfortable with integration don't worry about the same because we have some trick and method which can give the answer in one line but before that is can we do it from fundamental understanding of moment of inertia This is also uh, MR square by two. Is it? Uh, no, this is not MR square two. This is something more than that. So just from in there. Okay, so look at this article. So indeed, we'll take the elementary from center only. So we'll take theta and we'll take this. Yeah, I got M R square. No. Now this elementary will have a distance from the axis. How much? What is the distance of this elementary from the axis? And this distance is how much? It is R one plus cos theta. Because you can drop a perpendicular from here. This is r cos theta, and then r is already there. So the distance is r one plus cos theta. So if you have made a mistake here, then there is no question of getting the right answer. If not, then maybe some other calculation mistake may be there. So the di will be equal to di equals to dm r square. And uh, <clears throat> the dm we can write as same fashion <coughs> m by pi d theta, and the r square we can write as r square one plus cos theta. So it is not difficult. You just need to expand the uh, integration and then do it. So what you can add here is one plus cos theta four square. And you can expand like one plus cos theta plus two cos theta. 
something like this. And this is not difficult at all. Integration is not difficult. You know how to integrate. So <coughs> the last term will be zero because if you integrate cos theta from zero to pi, oh, not only zero, zero to, to pi. Zero to two pi, yeah. Yeah, zero to two pi. <laughs> So in order to, or you can do, take it, you can do it to zero to uh, pi and then multiply by two because the half above and the half below will be same. So that is also possible. We can do in many variety of ways. Okay, now who is left? Attendance should be made available. Okay. So once you do this integration, what you get is <coughs> three by two m s. <coughs> but this is you can do it from zero to two pi. Or uh, what I'll do is I'll make it to zero to okay, two pi. Not much. Okay. So next we can do this question. So I can show the rest of So now there are some questions which will come uh, and will be based on the derivation itself. So these are called derivation is specific problems. Imagine I give you a sphere. And the density is non uniform. So this is a solid sphere with a non-uniform density distribution. <laughs> so density is non-uniform, it's a variable. And how it is vary? Now that is interesting. So the variation of density follows the formula rho equals to rho naught, one minus R by capital R. where r is the instantaneous radius which you can take any value any random value and uh, capital r is definitely the maximum radius so which means if you go at a distance r the nearby that locality of r radius if you make a thin shell then in this volume of the shell, in this volume, density will be having this value not the constant origin. so r radius will have this density and the purpose of making a shell of thickness dr what the purpose the purpose is simple that the density at a distance r till the distance r plus dr is constant is same value because over the dr length further the density will not change significantly so we can assume this to be constant in value which value 
the value that we obtained at r so now the good thing is that what we have cut here is the shell you can think this as a spherical shell and we know the formula for a spherical shell and what is the formula so di equals to tell me anyone who remember the formula what is the moment of inertia of a thin shell two by three mr squared two by uh, two by three mr squared so now what do we should write here two by three mr squared mm plus dr dm into r square r is the radius yes sir the formula this is how we use the previous formula so we know the answer for the shell <clears throat> so although we cannot write the formula for the whole sphere as a whole but we can write for the shell but the shell will have fixed mass and fixed radius okay and now the next question is how to write dm so of course dm is simply density into volume So now density of which location? So at a distance r, which we know the answer. So which is rho naught. So what is dv? So dv represents the volume of the shell, thin shell. And how much is that? So four pi r square into dr. Four so pi. Those who don't know what is the volume of the shell, so you can add this as. There are many ways of thinking. Four by three pi. Now this is the most intuitive way of thinking for most of you. So the big is fair, minus is small is fair. And because dr is very small, so we can use binomial approximation. What is binomial approximation? One plus r plus three dr. Yeah, so we can take r common. We can add uh, binomial approximation directly. And this will give you the same answer. <coughs> Or the other method, those who don't prefer this, which you should not prefer. In fact, so volume is four by three. So you can differentiate with respect to R both side. And so the dV becomes again four pi. So you can do the way you want. So now we know we have the dm. In fact, it will be also interesting to find the mass of the sphere first in terms of the given density. So let's calculate the mass separately because this is something which I need. In, I need actually in order to express my answer. So what is the dm integration? Four uh, pi rho naught is constant, so we can take it out. And what we are left with is r square one minus r by r. <coughs> In two dr, right? And now I have to integrate from zero to capital R to get the answer. Now r square dr will be r cube by three, and then r cube will become r power four by four. So one by three minus one by four is one by twelve. So this becomes four pi rho naught r cube by twelve. This is pi rho naught. Now this will be used later on, as and when we need. But the primary goal is to calculate this value. So I hope you can just substitute the entire thing back to the formula and do the integration. It's the only matter of integration, nothing much. So I got this. So it is four pi into rho naught into r yeah. to the power five divided by forty five. So you are telling me the answer of the di, correct? The i actually. No, no, i moment of inertia. Very good. So the i turns out to be how much? <coughs> Tell me once again. So four pi into r naught. Oh, sorry, four pi into rho naught into r to the power five. Divide by forty-five. Okay, so now what you can do is, you can divide the answer by m. So what is the answer of i by m? Because I got m here and you got i here. So what is i by m?
m is pi Uh, so this turns out to be four r square by fifteen. That's nine. Huh? So i is yes. four by fifteen m r square. Now of course these kind of question you can expect in J E advanced only, and J E advanced will ask or they have been asking questions like this quite often. So integration. Uh, basically, the derivation based problems are part of the JE culture. <laughs> so even if you know the formula only, it will not help you. You need to know how to derive again from basic whenever we have some variation given to us. Okay. So I hope this is yeah not difficult. Yeah, maybe lengthy you can say, but with practice you can actually master this simple derivation. Okay, so this is the about habit. If you don't have this habit of derivation, please develop this habit. Okay. So one more problem that is again derivational, <coughs> but this is for everyone, not only for J advanced. So this is a rod problem. So in case of rod. The variation problems are very common. So let's say we have a rod of length L. Now the mass is not given to us. What is given to us is the lambda, and I hope you remember from the central mass chapter this lambda variation. Yes, sir. So lambda is lambda not times x. X is the, of course, the distance from the origin. Let's call this as origin, and uh, let's call this as x-axis. So now the first question is: Can you write the answer of moment of inertia about this axis? Yes, sir. And I want answer in terms of m, like not something like I want function of k m l square. Or you can say that if i equals to k m l square, then find k. So you have to first calculate m separately, calculate the i separately, then divide i by m, and get the answer. And then whatever is the coefficient of m l square, that is the k. So let's say this is the some numerical answer type question. N A T problem. So find k. This mass of hollow cone varies like this, no? Lambda not into x. Yeah, correct. That happens for cone actually. <coughs> but this is not a cone, so the r is not given, right? There's nothing yes. like r.
The key is half now. Okay, you're getting half. I am getting uh, one by two L not uh, L lambda not. Lambda not. I want to answer in terms of m and l, the like mass. So what you can do is you can cal calculate the mass separately and calculate the i separately, then divide i by m to get the answer in terms of m. Okay. Do this question. K K may be half. I think uh, K is half in fact. So <clears throat> half is the right answer, I think. So first let's find the M first. M is pretty easy. It's lambda dx zero to L. And the lambda is lambda not x dx from zero to L, which is lambda not L square by two. So the M we got the answer. The moment of inertia part will be, you have to go X and cut a DX. So this is the elementary mass and the distance from the axis itself is X only. So we can add DM, X squared, and that is and the DM that is lambda DX. Again, same, same approach. But lambda itself is lambda not X, DX, X squared. So, <coughs> This turns out to be lambda not x cube dx from zero to L, which is a very simple answer lambda not by four. So now we can write i by m is lambda not L power four by four, four divided by lambda not L square by two, which is L square by two. So the i is m L square by two. Now, if you compare with k m l square, the k turns out to be 1 by 2. So the answer is 1 by 2 is the right answer. So now these <coughs> are uh, called derivational problem. You need to derive from a very basic. So it won't be very difficult, but uh, one should know these derivation. Now, this is not again, again, I'm saying this is not meant for uh, this chapter called rotational dynamics. This is actually, if you look at other chapter like electrostatics or uh, magnetism or uh, elasticity, a very simple question, I mean, similar question will get with similar derivation. The only thing is mass can be replaced by charge and so on. So let's do one more problem. Okay. So the next problem is, <coughs> what if we have a variable, a disk with variable mass? Now this could be a problem of gravitation vector also. Again, I'm saying, what will help you is the derivation. So don't think that uh, I will face this question in this chapter. No, that there, is, that there is no possibility. You can face in all other chapters also. So it's good to know the method of derivation, how to deal with the derivation, how to proceed with the questions like this, what to write, what not to write, how to think. So all these are the part of learning process. And I'm trying to develop that uh, thinking ability through these problems. So many must be finding this very difficult. I will say, yeah, indeed, this is difficult. So we have a disk whose surface mass density, which we represent by sigma, where is left now? Now the sigma is given by the formula sigma naught. I'm keeping this term simple. R. It means 
at a distance r the sigma will have this value so as r will change as you go from center towards the perimeter the sigma will grow in value so uh, this is the question this is something like you can think of a concave lens in which the edges are thick and center is really thick if i make the edge center almost negligible thickness so the density will keep on growing if you go away from center it will become more and more and more so this is how we can define sigma r you can imagine something like this so the axis of rotation now the axis of rotation is normal to the plane okay so how to draw the normal to the plane if you remember we draw a circle So this is the axis. <coughs> so now the question is same. Find the moment of inertia as k m r square. Find k. So you all can try this sum. Are you guys doing this problem? This next. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. The K is three by five. Okay. 
So anybody else who has tried this stuff? So we look at the solution now. So we will do the same thing. We'll go R and cut a DR as a elementary thickness further. So this is the elementary ring actually, and we know the answer for the ring, correct? So for ring, what is the answer? About an axis per perpendicular to the plane passing through the center. So the moment finishes MR. So we cannot DMR. And DM will be sigma DA. And sigma is sigma not R DA is two pi R DR now. <coughs> By this time, I hope you must be <coughs> fluent with this uh, writing process. If not, then I can practice. There is no other option. Answer is MR square by 2. <laughs> of course not. Sigma is very well, huh? So for this, the answer is MR square by 2. So if you put a sigma value here, see the sigma. So you will get something like this. So now you can integrate. Na? So what is i coming? <coughs> 2 pi sigma naught r 2, 3, 4, r power 5 by 5. Correct? Yes. And let's put the mass. Mass will be how much? Sigma not R by R dr. <coughs> I'm doing this in small space. So two pi sigma naught and R square. So R Q by three. <laughs> so I by M turns out to be how much? Two pi sigma naught R power five upon five divided by 2 pi sigma naught r cube upon 3. So you can see the answer is 3 by 5 r squared. <coughs> so answer is 3 by 5 m r squared. So k is 3 by 5.6. So I hope this is not very difficult. So These are the fundamental problems, uh, or you can say these problems require derivational skill. So, although someone knowing the formula of entire formula, all the theorem of uh, rotational dynamics, but that will not help. So, that is a reality. Okay. So now we can do something more. <coughs> so now <coughs> in the last lecture, we derived something like a moment of inertia for a triangular lamina. Okay. If we have a triangular lamina, this is a right angle triangle.
Sir, if we take uh, axis as the end user, that we have to take uh, the I end of rod. Yes. Dm x square by three, like that. Once again, tell me what what you say. So you said <coughs> that, uh, uh, last time you said that uh, at the uh, if we take axis at the end, then. Uh, so no, I mean, it's a lamina question last question. Where, where, this question? Yeah, so, sir, you, you said no, that uh, you take the diagonal. If we... So you're saying this question, triangular lamina? Yes, sir. Okay. So if you have a triangular lamina, And if I say this is A as a, the length, so this vertex is the farthest point from the axis, right? So this vertex is the farthest point from the, uh, or this is this vertex is at a distance A from the axis, that's the idea. And the rest, the two vertex are on the axis. Now, this is what you need to take care of. That one axis, my bad, one vertex is at a distance A. Other two are at zero distance. One at A, another two are at zero distance. That's right. <laughs> so the answer turns out to be how much? I was how much, if you remember? M by? How much? If you remember the answer? M is square by six. Correct. So if you remember, this was the answer. M is square by six. So <clears throat> if I give you something like this, let's say if I don't give you the right angle triangle, this is the right angle triangle. So in a way, this is easy for you. So what if I don't give you right angle triangle? So now we have a triangle of any random shape, okay? And I'm not going to fill this space, that's a little indicator. And now what I'm giving you, the distance of vertex. <coughs> So, so it is at the vertex is at a distance a as you can see <coughs> mass is m so what will be the answer for i so if the mass is m and the vertex is at a distance uh, a from the axis and the remaining two vertexes again back on the same axis. So what the I will remain same as. So you may be wondering why. So it's pretty easy. So let's call this mass as M1, this as M2. 
now we have two right angle triangles now we can write the answer what we can write m1 a square by 6 and m2 a square by 6 and we can see that we can take common m1 and plus m2 and so the answer is m a square by 6 so it really doesn't matter the shape is right angle or not what we need is the distance of the third vertex so once you know the distance of the third vertex the answer is pretty much obvious so m a square by 6 <coughs> okay and the should yes Yes. Yes. Oh. Another next question is uh, pretty much same. What if I extend this on both side? So now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create a, a quadrilateral in which two sides or two vertex are on the given axis of rotation, and other two vertex are. Maybe I can do something like this. It could be rectangle, but need not to. So as you can see, <clears throat> in this quadrilateral, the four vertex are there, and you can clearly see that out of four vertex, two lies on the axis. Now we have two vertex which is not on the axis, <coughs> and let's call the distance is a, and this is b. Now this is the lamina, sir. Quadrilateral lamina. So, if it is a quadrilateral lamina, <coughs> then the question is, and the total mass is capital. I mean, smaller. Let's say. So, the mass of the lamina is m. So, what is the moment of inertia? Can you do this uh, jugad and get the answer? So, both the areas are equal. That 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 you have to think. That you have to. So I cannot reveal the process. So you have to think of it. So can you come up with some solution to this question? So the idea is, can you use the previous answer at your advantage? And then get the answer of this unknown lamina. Now that's the challenge. So M A square plus B square by six. Uh, okay, not exactly, but you need to think about.
sir the total mass is m yes the mass is m is for total mass not for individual so you have to divide the mass in proportion to something or something you have to decide what is proportional mass so in case of lamina the mass will be proportional to what area area exactly so now think in terms of area <coughs> so let's call the entire mass on the left as m1 and on the right let's call m2 now your answer is obvious so you can say m1 plus sorry m1 a square plus m2 b square by 6 now this is the answer so far so far this is the answer but what is m1 what is m2 so now we can say m1 m2 will be proportional to area so m1 upon <coughs> m2 is equals to half into base into height now base is same for both, both so let's call x as a base so the white line is same for both triangle so base is same so the area is half into base into height m1 half into base into height it turns out to be the mass ratio is equals to the perpendicular distance ratio a is to b and now you know how to substitute and all because the sum is m so it is similar problem to the rod problem if you remember the rod problem we have done this somewhere here maybe here yeah. yes this is the same thing. <coughs> so if you if you substitute the value what you get is M by six a square minus a b plus b square. And now this formula is very very important for you, and you must remember this. I don't know how difficult it is to remember, but yeah, it is. <coughs> okay. So this is clear, guys. So not so easy, na? No? Somewhat challenging. <laughs> Now, what is the benefit of this? Second issue. Now this is a rectangle. and this is the axis of rotation now this comes under the one of the most challenging problem and i must move it the moment to finish but you can think this as a same quadrilateral problem you can think so this, this is as a pardon this is a perfect rectangle This is a rectangular, yeah, proper rectangle. This is a rectangular lamina. All angles are right angles, as you can see. <clears throat> so, what will be the moment of inertia?
Are you guys solving this question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No. Yes, tell me. And I got uh, i equals to m by six into a square b under root of the a square b divided by under root b square plus a square. I hope you're getting this answer right. Yes, sir. Hmm. Yeah, that should be the right answer. <laughs> so what you need to find is H only, the perpendicular. And both will be same actually. And the H turns out to be how much? A B upon A square plus B square. We have done this thousand times. <laughs> yes. And now the formula is pretty much simple. It's M by six a square plus <coughs> minus b square plus b square. Here a and b are same. A is same as b. So i tends to be mh square by six. That's the only answer. And that's why this is the correct answer. Okay. So now I'll give you something very <coughs> a generalized formula. Let's say if I create any random triangle. You just create a, a random triangle in a plane. So this triangle lies in the same plane as the axis, let's say.
So you can see this is some random triangle. This is the axis, and let's say this is uh, rigidly fixed with some invisible glass rod of height h1 h2 h3. <coughs> so what is the moment of inertia of this uh, entire thing about this axis? <coughs> now, of course, you can do the derivation and you can use the uh, superposition principle to get the answer, but that is going to be very tricky and difficult. So what you can do is you can do it like this. See the formula is very nice. Formula. That's it. So you apply anywhere you will get all answer. <clears throat> now, you can see that H1, H2, S3 are on the same side. But what if they are on the other side in two different two different sides of the axis? <coughs> so when it is on the two different sides of the axis, then you have to take a negative side. So if you take the up as positive, take down as negative. Understood. So in this formula, it will take care of everything, including the question that we just solved. But here H is on the other side, so we have to take one as plus, other as minus. So if you just choose the proper sign convention, and if you put in this formula, this will give you answer for any random question. And now this is a serious Olympiad problem. No need to worry. This will not come in any exams, except some test series of big coaching issues, nothing else. Okay. <coughs> Sir, I want to note this one. So, so now the formula that we just derived it could be very helpful in solving question of like a square sheet so what is the moment of inertia for Square lamina. About this axis. About this axis. About this axis. And we'll see something interesting. Let's take the side length as A. Now, in case of square lamina, first question, and listen to this very carefully. How many axes of symmetry we can do? You know, axis of symmetry, which can divide into two equal halves. Yes, so sir. how many axis of symmetry you can see in four. case of this? So four. Tell me, guys, everyone. Four. four. So options are A, 2, B, 4, C, 8, and D, 2 power N. Limit n tends to infinity. Oh, in short, infinite. So, which option is correct? <laughs> option B four. Infinite.
So because it's a square lamina, so any random line which will pass through the center will have this will create a line of symmetry. You can see that it will divide into exactly two halves. Can you see that? One half. And exactly a replica on the other side. The other half. It is just inverted, right? But it's same thing. Huh? So with respect to axis, it looks exactly the same. So we can draw any line passing through the center in the plane of the lamina. That, that, that's the condition. You must draw the line in the plane of the lamina passing through the center. So no matter where you draw, all will give you the same answer. Sorry, all will be the line of symmetry. So the answer is D. Okay, so meanwhile, We'll think about this D answer later on also. Tell me the answer for I1 and I2. Because I think I1, I3 are same as you can see. M E squared with 12. Pardon? I2 is M E squared with 12 and I1 is same. So both are yeah. M will be 12. <clears throat> so no matter which one you choose, now this is something most revelation that whichever axis you choose, it will be M A square by 12. And for that matter, I will prove also later on. That even if I draw some axis, a random axis, which makes some random angle theta, even this answer will be also same. So as long as the line is passing through the center of the square and is in the plane of the lamina, the answer will be same. And we will prove it using some uh, method. Okay. <clears throat> is this clear? Yes, sir. Okay. So here goes the theorem. So there is a theorem actually. Little bit advanced, but uh, just remember this. It's good for your memory. So let's say if you know the answer about two mutually perpendicular axes. So let's say you have a rect some rect rectangle, let's say. And we know the answer about uh, this axis, let's call i y. And this axis, let's call i x. So let's say I know these two answers. I know these two answers. Known. So the third axis we draw in the plane of the body, which makes an angle, let's say theta with x axis. Then this answer i turns out to be i x cos square theta because the theta is with x axis and i y. <coughs> Cos is called 90 minus theta, which is sine is called theta. So this is the in general answer. Now, if you apply this formula in case of a square, something interesting happens. So we know I3 will be, let's say I0. Then I1 is also going to be same value because they are symmetrical value. So they are exactly same. So if in case of a square, Ix, Iy becomes, we know what I mean. So what I can write I, I equals to, <coughs> so I1 cos square theta plus I3 sine square theta. 
but fortunately i1 and i2 are same and so i becomes and this is the proof which says that the moment of inertia is independent of theta you can see the answer has no dependency on theta for a square lamina but this is not true for the rectangular lamina because here the ix iy are different so that we cannot take it common and add sin square and cos square to get one but in case of square lamina it's a very interesting case so no matter which line you draw it will give you the same answer as the i1 or i3 therefore in case of square lamina any line which you draw through the center all line will give you same answer so the infinite line about which the moment of inertia turns out to be same now of course these are some very advanced concept but you just remember the formula and you are done so at the j level even knowing the formula is <coughs> knowing more than enough so these are the some of the very fundamental relation in moment of inertia so now we are good to go with some other concept <coughs> Now, what are the other concept? Now, basically, this was a J advanced model. So they simply gave the relation that which of the feeling is true, I1 equals to I2 or equals to I3 equals to I4 or something like this. <coughs> and uh, yes. Okay, let's leave that question now. So after doing all the basic stuff, knowing all the basic formula and knowing the derivational aspect of moment of inertia, we will move towards something called theorem in moment of inertia. So theorems, we'll deal with two theorems and So there are two famous theorem on uh, moment of inertia. The first is parallel axis theorem, and second is perpendicular axis theorem. And again, theorems are not something some miracle rather we also need to know the proof of the theorem so theorems are basically a mathematical tool which will uh, facilitate the the effort with which we derive the answer for various bodies so if you know certain answer or the primitive answer the basic answer which we just which i gave as a one sheet if you remember so someone knowing these answers so this is a very, very uh, important page for you. So if you know these basic fundamental answers, then what this term says that you can actually get the other answer. I mean, like answer about some other axis, you can say not answer. So let's say I know the moment of inertia about one particular axis, and then I need to find the moment of inertia about some other axis, then there is no need to go back to derivation. So rather I'm giving you some of the theorem which you can directly apply and get to your answer so theorems are the alternative which can prevent your derivational effort in some case but in some case uh, you need to move ahead with the derivation get some answer which is easier for you and then apply the parallel or the perpendicular axis theorem to get the more complex answer so as you will see the numericals which i will introduce you you will realize that what exactly needs to be done in order to get a particular answer so now the intuition will not come suddenly it will take some time but gradually you will realize that okay why these theorems are there and how we can use two hour at i mean at our advantage okay so now the parallel axis theorem <clears throat> and uh, perpendicular axis theorem are the two famous theorem given in this chapter so uh, I'll just write the proof because if I explain the proof, I mean, probably half of you will, will start throwing the stones on me. 
that's really rigorous vector proof so i just write for the sake of completeness but uh, no need to worry if you don't even understand that so no need to worry at all the perpendicular axis term is pretty easy so you will realize this so let's begin with the first theorem parallel axis So what this theorem says, it says that if you know the answer of moment of inertia of a body about some random axis, but which passes through the center mass. So let's say, let me do some body, some random shape body. So this is the body and now it must have somewhere center mass. I don't know where the center mass is. That's called, uh, it looks somewhere here. So now what I will say is, let's say someone is asking you to find the moment of inertia about this axis. So now this is the requirement. So now someone is demanding that find the moment of inertia about this axis, I. And let's say you don't know the answer. So now, <clears throat> What you need to do is, let's say you don't know this answer, but somehow you can, or you know the answer for that axis, which is parallel to this axis. So in short, draw a line, which is parallel to the given axis, but passing through central mass. So this is the basic idea that if you can draw any axis which passes through the center mass. So now <clears throat> let's call this as ICM. Now ICM can be, there may be infinite ICM, but I am only interested in that ICM which is parallel to the desired axis, the axis from which, I mean, of which we won't find the answer. So I is something which we are looking for. And I seem something, let's say you know the answer in advance, somehow you know, I don't know how. So now between these two axes, as you can see, there must be some perpendicular separation. So these two axes may be at some separation, I mean, not the separation may be somewhere here. No, I can do it somewhere else. So, what else we need to know is the per penetral separation between the axes. Let's call it D. So, what this theorem says that the I is pretty simple add ICM to the value called mass of the body into the square of the separation between the axis. Now this is pretty simple to write. I equals to ICM plus MD square. That's it. 
so how to put into words so moment of inertia about a given axis is equals to the sum of moment of inertia about an axis passing through center mass parallel to the given axis and the product of mass to body and the square of the separation between the axis now i know whatever i have said is okay this must have gone over your head so this is simple formula and we put into words it's difficult i know so writing is pretty easy but uh, putting into words are difficult so what i'll do is i'll just mention the the definition okay so moment of inertia of a body about any given axis is equals to see how difficult it is to put into words equals to sum of moment of inertia of the body about an axis passing through center of mass and parallel to given axis and so many and and all and uh, product of mass of the body with square of the separation between the axes the separation is, is always the minimum separation which means for a perpendicular separation so sometimes i have seen the student they, they take this as separation this is not the separation separation is always perpendicular not the joining the some point so you cannot say some this is separation you cannot say this is separation separation is only the perpendicular all right so now this is the uh, theoretical definition if you want to read uh, most welcome but even if you understand this formula that's more than sufficient so before you apply the formula try to realize what i'm trying to explain through this formula so read once again i mean do it mentally something like to find the answer about a given axis what i will do so first i will draw a line which will be parallel to the given line or given axis to i mean I, Uh, given axis, and then add the extra term, which is called m d square, which is nothing but the product of mass of the body and the square of the separation between them. Okay, so once you do this, your job is pretty much done. So now, if you are intending for proof, I can give the proof, but let me discourage you for the proof. So I'll send the proof uh, as a some uh, screenshot. You can just read and see if you want to send something. Then go for yes. Leave this part. So let's come to the next one, which is called perpendicular. Axis. now this theorem having certain restriction you cannot apply anywhere so perpendicular axis now the concept of perpendicular is only defined for a, some lamina from uh, for some plane lamina so this theorem is basically applicable for something called planar lamina because only in that case you can have something perpendicular so you cannot apply for something three dimensional object we can only apply for two dimensional object so that's the first restriction 
So, sir, if we want to apply for three dimensional object, then what we can do? The answer is no, you cannot apply. But if I want to apply, then what I can do? The answer is you cannot apply. But if I want to do that, then you need to cut the body into thin slices, which can behave as a plain lamina. <clears throat> so every three dimensional body <clears throat> can be cut into thin slices. And it is possible that each slice may become a lamina. And then you may apply the answer for that lamina, and then you get the answer through integration. So that is a way to proceed. So in case of two dimension, this is applicable in case of three dimension. There is no such concept like perpendicular axis. This is not applicable. And if you want to make it applicable in a three dimensional body, take a slice of the body, which will behave as a plane lamina and then apply this theorem, whatever it is going to, I'm going to say. So what this theorem says? <clears throat> so let's consider some body first. So, okay. Mm -hmm. So now let's say this is some lamina, some planar sheet of some random shape. I'm not uh, very much interested in the actual shape. It can be any random shape. So now the, what this theorem says that you want to find the moment of inertia about an axis which is perpendicular to this plane. Okay. So not an issue. Let's do the line. So let's call this is the line which is uh, of maybe like this. Let's call this is the line which is per perpendicular to the plane. So this is your target. This is what you are trying to find. But unfortunately, you may not be knowing the answer. So for the sake of uh, identification, let's call this I Z, like the Z axis. And I'm I'm saying this plane as X Y plane. Now this makes sense to you now because this is x y plane then i z must be normal to the plane okay so this is something you're looking for so either you may be knowing this answer or you may not may not be knowing the answer but let's say you know some other answer so what other answer you know so you know the answer of moment of inertia about an axis which passes through the same plane. So it, this axis, the blue axis is in the plane of the body. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to do, draw two such axes, which lies in the plane of the body, but their intersection must be at the point where the perpendicular axis is drawn. Now that's the criteria we must join the two parallel uh, two perpendicular axis in the plane of the body so in short the ix and iy must be drawn 
only at that point where the normal axis is passing. So the IZ is passing. So let's say you know the answer for IX or IY. And if you know the answer, then it's pretty easy. So in this particular body, let's consider a small patch. And this is small patch. Let's call it X, Y as a coordinate because this is an X, Y plane. This is X, Y. Now you, you can see this patch lies in the X, Y plane. So what is the per perpendicular distance of this patch from the X axis? Tell me how far is this is from the X axis? Any idea? My how far it is from the X axis? So by and how far it is from the Y axis? X. Very. And because this is a DMR, <coughs> so how far is this elementary mass is from the Z axis? Now that's the question. What is the distance from this mass from the Z axis? So under root X square plus Y square. Correct. So now let me call this as R. And from Pythagoras, we know the R square is X squared plus Y squared. Okay. <clears throat> now, what we are looking for is we are looking for I Z. So the answer is simple: no? DM R square integration. That's it. Because to know the answer from given axis, you need to know the distance from the given axis, which in this case is pretty much obvious R. So my job is done. So what is IZ? DM R square and what is DM? Uh, DM is DM. But we can write R square as X square plus Y square. Now what I can do is I can expand this integration. So I can write DM X square and DM Y square. So I'm just splitting the answer into two parts. And why I'm doing this intentionally? Because I know the answer for the Individual. What is the first term representing? Anyone? What is the first term representing? I. Hmm? I. I. Y. Y. Very good. The first term is I Y because the X is the distance from the Y axis. And so, what is the second term representing? I X. And now, you have the answer. This line, this answer is nothing but the perpendicular axis theorem. So this is your theorem. Now, how to put this into words? Like, let's say if I have to write this in a school examination. So how I can put this into words? What I should say? Anybody? So putting this into language is even more challenging. Anyone who, who can try to put into language.
Okay, so I think no one is interested in putting two words, so I need to put two words. So let me give you the statement. And this is really challenging. Would it say that moment of inertia of a plane lamina about any perpendicular axis is equals to sum of moment of inertia about two mutually perpendicular axis lying in the plane <coughs> of the body whose origin No, not with origin, whose intersection lies on the perpendicular axis. So this is the statement. Now the IZ is IX plus IY. The rule says the two axes which you add, now well, that's a very interesting fact. The two axes which you add must be in the plane of the lamina. And the perpendicular is the third axis. So you cannot write So why you cannot write because the y and z are not part of the plane. So similarly, you cannot write i x and i z. So only thing which you can add is those axes which are in the plane and are mutually perpendicular. And you must draw the axis in such a way that their intersection must be on the third axis. Okay. So if you meet all these conditions, then this formula is true. So I hope the statement is clear to all of you. It is clear. And yes. this is a simple uh, proof here. So because this proof is pretty easy, so I have given here. The other proof is also easy, but uh, it's a pure vector uh, terms uh, multiplied and. So now the whole idea is like you have to use the formula only. So just concentrate on the formula but why the derivation was given so that you can also realize that in which case the formula should be applied or when we apply the formula then what are the things which should be taken care of so if you know the reason of the formula how it is developed then probably you will not make any mistake in doing the numerator so let's do this So we'll start with the I think this problem again. So this is the disk. Okay. Now this is the axis which is per pentacle to the plane of the body, right? And I believe that you know this answer already. So what this I value? Tell me guys. What is I value? 
एमआर एमआर स्क्वायर बाय टू करेक्ट सो द आंसर इज प्रीटी मच नोन टू यू दिस इज एमआर स्क्वायर सो नाउ दिस इज द रिवर्स केस आई नो दिस आंसर सो इफ लुक एट दिस क्वेश्चन आई नो दिस आंसर so maybe we are looking for some other answer so what i am looking for look at this so i am looking for the moment of inertia about an axis which is the diametric axis like anything which passes through a diameter so i am looking for this answer the diameter so m r square this board yeah so let let others to think and say so what we can correlate what what we can do to get the answer Which theorem we can apply? I think the answer we, which you know, and the answer which you are looking for, tells you that uh, what to apply. Okay, are, are these two axes parallel to each other? No. 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 Parallel we cannot apply for sure. So the first part is gone. The parallel axis theorem we cannot apply. Now are these two perpendicular? Yes. 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 Is the I lying in the plane of the body? Yes. Is I Z normal to the body? Yes. Sir, I'm R square by four. Yeah. Correct. So now the idea is, you have to do some manipulation to get the answer. And what we can do? We can draw one more axis, which is the part of the same plane, but for a particular to the first body. And now we can use the symmetricity. Do you see any difference between this axis and the axis which I have just drawn? No. Which means answer must be same. So if I yes. consider I, this must be I. I. And we know the answer that if I add these two, this must be equals to I. Now this is the consequence of perpendicular axis here. In short, I'm not like this. And because I know the I Z value, so now my job is done. Huh? So I is how much? I Z by two. And so you know the answer is M R square by four. So for this, this is the diametric axis. That is a, about a diameter. And the answer is M R square by two. Uh, same if you ask me question, if you ask me question for the ring about uh, this axis. M R square by two. Correct. So now you know the answer clearly that I I know the answer for perpendicular and I can draw something like this. So this must be half of the value. So again, this simple theorem saves enough time, okay, enormous time. In fact, <laughs> it saves you from the calculation. So once you understand that uh, what I know and what I am looking for, if I can correlate these two somehow. We are done. So anything which is planar, which lies in the plane, we can apply. Need not to be lamina only. Anything which is in a plane, we can apply. So we can say two i equals to i z, which is m r square. So definitely i is. So this kind of symmetrical or symmetricity argument we can always bring up, as and when we need. So. Let's go back to the problem of uh, square lamina because that is something very fascinating. So let's see, can we derive the same using the argument that we have just learned? Eh? So what we have learned now? So earlier I gave you some very uh, complex formula of sine square and cos square, and I told you okay, if you use this formula, you get that. But what if you don't know the formula? And the answer is, it really doesn't matter. Now, in case of uh, square lamina, if you remember, this answer was known to you, and this was known to you. How much? M is square by twelve. How much? M is total. Now, this is something other than that. You know the plain answer, correct? And now the question is obvious: What is this answer? So I want, to, I want to know this. I want to know this I Z. Suddenly one fine day I came up with this idea. Okay, what is this answer? 
So again, same thing. If I know the answer in a plane, I can get this answer. So what is I said? M square by six. Correct. M square. All right. So now, <clears throat> what we do is we draw a line like this. And I want to know this answer because I have no idea. Right now, I have no idea. But I know one more thing that I can draw one more line. Perpendicular to that line. Exactly, which is normal to this line. And I know that if this answer is I dash, this is bound to be I dash. And even the sum of these two, I can put the same logical argument that I dash plus I dash. Again, we should get the I Z only, correct? And I Z I have already derived from the other method, correct? So I Z was how much? Two I. M A square by six. So two I dash is two I, which simply means I dash is I. And that's a very interesting way of deriving that no matter which axis you draw in the plane, we are going to get the same answer. Correct? And the answer is how much? M A square by 12. So now you also derive the formula that I dash is equals to M A square by 12. Okay, so now what we're doing is we are applying the argument of perpendicular axis theorem. So questions like disk, uh, square, rectangle, anything in a plane, one should think about perpendicular axis theorem to get the answer from the answer which you know already. And if you don't know already, then try to remember the basic first. Because every difficult question will be like kind of some of the primitive problems which you have solved in the very beginning. So as we scale up the difficulty, we need to remember the previous answers. Then only you can actually apply in a more rigorous problem like this. So this is not difficult, but you can see the how you can use the simplicity argument, how we can use the perpendicular axis theorem to get the answer. But is this the only thing we can do? The answer is of course not, we can do something more than that. So let's see something more than that. So, so far I have not invoked the uh, parallel axis system. Yeah, so you must be missing that. All those that you have given in the very beginning, but you're not using it. So don't worry, I'm going to use it very soon. Now, most question of the parallel axis theorem sometimes requires the perpendicular answer. So by using the perpendicular axis theorem, we get some answer. And once we know those answers, actually we can go back to the parallel to get something more complex. So for parallel axis theorem, there is no limitation. You can, you can apply for all types of bodies, whether it's planar or three-dimensional or one-dimensional, which really doesn't matter. Okay, so now this is the body. This is rectangle, if you remember, this is the length, let's say, and between this is B. And I'm looking for the answer. This is the cutting this body into two halves. This is also same. So if I call this I, Y, if I call this I, X, I know you can find both answers separate. So the obvious question is, can you find I, Z? And if no. yes, what should be the answer? What is, what is the IZ answer? So can we apply the parallel, uh, sorry, perpendicular axis theorem? Yes, sir. And if you can apply then, <coughs> do, do we know the answer for M by 12 or uh, L squared plus B squared? Correct. And now this is the famous answer. And if you put A equals to B, it becomes the square problem, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. So now once you know the how to apply the perpendicular axis, sir, then you can play something 
which is a more difficult or challenging or more involved problem in moment of inertia. So let's see what kind of problem we can solve with this combination of theorem. So I got answer with one theorem, but in most of the question, you need to apply both the theorems at the same time. So you need to apply one theorem to get one answer, then apply again to get the desired answer. So look at this question. So the question is very simple. Not I will not give it difficult. So this is big one. Uh, okay, let's go back to the previous. So if you remember, we solved one question of a, a ring, correct? I hope you remember this question. Yes, sir. And I, I ask you that what is the answer about this axis? Yeah? This was the challenging for you, right? Yes, so now sir. the question is simple. This is the question now, again, same question. Now, what are the series of steps or like sequence of uh, steps which you will apply to arrive at this answer from the answer so which you know. Perpendicular axis theorem to the mm. perpendicular at the origin of a center. And then mm. we can apply the uh, parallel axis theorem to that. Correct, correct. So now, correct. So now we know this answer, correct? Or we can get this answer about using the perpendicular axis theorem. So from the answer which we know, I can find this, I can call it ICM. And now this ICM is parallel to the I. So I can now apply the theorem. What is the theorem? I equals to ICM plus mass into D square. Now what is ICM? So to get this ICM, we can draw one more line and we can get the third line, which is IZ, which we know the answer. So if you remember, we have just done this before. This is how much? I hope you remember this answer. No, yes. this is the answer. So now this is also ICM. This is ICM. Okay. Three M R square by two. Correct. So now you can see that how fast you can get the answer without doing the integration. Now the whole purpose of using the theorem is to speed up the process. So instead of going back to the very uh, basic derivational method, we can play with the formula which we know. So this is how we actually proceed. We first try to use the uh, theorem. If we fail to use the theorem, we go back to derivation. Then we don't derive everything. We derive something which we can do with ease. And then we use that answer to get the other answer using the theorem. So now this a repetitive formula we have to apply to get or arrive at the answer which we're looking for. So similarly, if I give you a disk, and this should not be very difficult for you guys. So if this is the disk, and then same problem, what is the moment of inertia about this axis? So like a, if you have a hand uh, fan, you know, which you move hand right and left, you must have seen such things. So what is the moment of inertia? I equals to how much? So pi by, pi by four into MR squared. Of course, this is mr square plus mr square by 4. I mean, I'm just writing directly. And if you're having this difficulty, you can just let me know. So, the answer is how much? 5 by 4? Yeah. So, is it difficult, guys? Also. No. So look at this problem, which is again very famous and very important question in from JE point of view. And these are not difficult problems. So let's say if I give you a cube.
Okay, so all there's a three dimensional solid cube, but uh, as you can see, solid cube, transparent solid cube. Okay, I'll zoom it. Yeah, what we can do, we can do nothing. And now this is a cube. So this is A, A, A. Okay. And now the question is simple. Can you find the moment of inertia above this axis? Hmm? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is very easy. You can just try this. So before that, see, if, whenever we have some object which can be expanded or shrinked along the, you can say parallel to axis, then, okay, I, I hope you remember what I'm saying. So this answer will not change. See, one of the dimension is meaningless to us. Which dimension? Z. Correct. Not that. Yeah, you can say this is. If I call I Z, then Z dimension is meaningless. So because anything which I spread along the length of the, if I make a something a disc like this, or even if I make a cylinder like this, both are symmetrical. Why? Because pulling the mass parallel to the axis will not make any difference. No? Yes, sir. Because the distance will remain in the same ratio. So you can cut into thin slices and imagine this is slice, then what is the answer? The same answer will go for this slice, the same answer will go for this slice, and therefore all answer will add up in the same fashion. So the third dimension, the dimension which is parallel to the axis will have no meaning if it is symmetrical. Can anyway, try this out? <laughs> Two by three MA square. Uh, two by three MA square. Let me check. So I will be equal to I think ICM, which is the axis parallel to this axis. This is the ICM. And what is the separation between these two? A root two. A by root two. Very good. This is A by root two. So that's the only correct sequence is A by root 2. That's okay. And I think we just got the answer. Right? M is square by 6. 6. Yeah. Plus M is square by This is how much? 2 by 3 M is square, no? Yes, sir. That's the right answer. Okay. All right. So, this is the fourth question. So, what I give you is a big sphere. And now, difficult to, and there's a cube. So what is the biggest possible cube you can draw in the sphere? Question is from a, let me first draw the sphere first. Ah, sorry, cube first. So can you show the previous page? Just let me do this. This is a by root. Done. Okay. Done? Yes. Now, the question is simple. We have to 
we have a given uh, what we have given is a, I mean uh, what we have given is a, a sphere not a cube and this sphere this cube is a part of a, some sphere some big sphere is there and this is inside this sphere okay so now the question is if the radius of the sphere is r solid sphere of mass m and the radius the question is this way so first of all you remove this cube out of a sphere and the other condition is that to remove the biggest possible cube from the sphere so i'm putting the question in as a step step one is remove biggest possible cube from solid sphere and step two is find moment of inertia about <coughs> an axis passing through center of two parallel surfaces now this language you need to decode into mathematics i hope you understood what is the question yes sir so the axis is passing through the center of two parallel surfaces so you know what kind of axis is that and the other part is what is the biggest possible cube dimension that you have to think in terms of r so okay so let's try this out this was a question from j what do you think advance or means advance Imagine it was, possible, it was a uh, main question. Yeah. So the biggest possible cube will have side uh, r root two. No, see, this is three dimension. So go in three D. Think in terms of three D. So what you are trying to think is in terms of two uh, <coughs> D. Okay, what is the two D equivalent of this question? The biggest square, biggest square in a circle. Yes, sir. Or, or, or a disk. So, what is the biggest square in a disk? When the diagonal of the square is the diameter of the circle. It's the root two a is equal to two r. So, a is equal to r by root two. Yeah. So, when when root two a is two r. Now, this is a two dimension. But in three D, what is happening? What is the biggest side of a three D? So of a cube. Three r. In so cube, the three biggest three side is the root three. Yeah, very good. Root three a is root three a is equal to two r. So now this will give you a value, but the other problem is you have to also find the mass of this cube because mass is not given. Mass is given for the sphere. So using the volume relation, you can find the mass. Correct. So now go ahead, and because the formula is pretty simple, it's the only calculation how to think of a side of the cube, how to think of a mass of the cube, and then moment of inertia part is pretty easy. It's a straightforward answer. We know this answer. <coughs> so by the way, what is the formula for the moment of inertia?
Yes. So what, what is the formula? Tell me, guys. At least formula you can tell me. So the axis in which we are talking about in the step two is which axis? So the axis passing to the center of the circle, so center of the sphere. I see. I'm talking about the cube, not the circle or sphere. Once you remove the cube, then you have to find the answer. <coughs> so if the side of the cube, let's say, if I call this side as A, then tell me what is the answer for I, which we are looking for. And let's say the mass of the cube is M cube. What is the answer? So what we are looking for, which formula we should apply here? No idea. Eh? M square by six. Correct. So now your job is to find A and M and put in the five value. You will get the answer. That's it. Because the axis I'm talking about is the center of the two parallel surface, which is nothing but the center. I see M. I see Correct. And this we just did, no? Yes, sir. So your job is to find the mass and the A from the unitary method or whatever method you can do. I don't know how you can do, but this is pretty much uh, obvious to get the answer. So tell me the answer, guys, everyone. So four r square by pi into nine by root three. Four. Nee, sir, nee. A four r square by pi nine root three. Four pi r square by nine root three, like this. No, pi is in the denominator. So four m r square. What is it? Four m r square. Four m r square, right? Hmm, something like this is correct, but I think four is not there. Maybe something 15 was there. <clears throat> so what is the mass of the cube anyway? Uh, two by two M by pi root three. Is m by 4 by 3 pi r cube into a cube, correct? And a, a is how much? A is 2 r by root 3. Uh, 2 r by root 3. Full cube. So it is m 4 by 3 pi into 8 by 3 root 3. Okay. So it's 2m by root 3 pi, eh? Is this answer? Yes, sir. 
Okay. No, no problem. So now the I is M A is square. Mm. 2R by root 3 whole square by 6. This turns out to how much? Uh, 4 to the 8. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Two, 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 six, two, five. Yeah, that's correct answer. So this will become three. Four. So what you said is correct. Four M R is square upon nine root three pi. So this is the mass of the cube. This is the moment definition. And this is the question from the, uh, your J means 215. And of course it's what, it was challenging for, for many it was challenging. But if you can just think on a pattern, it is easy. So I have tried to bring you from the very basic problem to this problem in a sequence of, uh, other intermediate problems so that you should not feel difficult. But if you just look at the problem for the first time, it will be difficult. So we are done with the half of the multiplication, almost 60% we are done with, or 70%. The next lecture will be for miscellaneous problem, which are unique problem and you have to think quite differently to solve such problems. And we'll also do the some questions of uh, truncated bodies when you remove a mass and then you try to find the motivation. Just like the negative mass concept, we also have the negative uh, mass concept here also. So we can subtract the motivation from a body which I know the answer and something which you have removed. So those things will be there. So the next lecture will be only for like peculiar problems, like problems which you need to know actually in advance to attempt in examination. If you don't know in advance, Probably it will be very challenging for you to think at the same time. So now these were the basic problems. We have done with the basic problem and uh, uh, we'll start the, the interesting one in the next picture. So till then, uh, good bye and take care. I hope you have the next lecture coming after half an hour. So see you in the next lecture. I think the next lecture is tomorrow, no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Tomorrow. So have I shared the rotational sheet with you guys? No, sir. No, just let me share this first. I think I have shared. No. I have forgot this. So you can solve all the J problems, like you can solve J mains and J advanced problems with ease. Okay. No difficulty at all. So what I'll do in the next lecture will be much more beyond this. So any question of a J mains, advanced, NEET, or whatever exemption in the world which has been asked, you can solve with this knowledge. And you must try those questions in fact. Okay, I'll be sending you soon.